I will leave it at that. All right. This week, we talk about infectious disease. We're going to dive into infectious disease and specifically, I guess, what we would call evolutionary medicine. Our main overarching concern today is what are the ecological relationships like between humans and pathogens? Are we evolved uh, to coexist with pathogens? Are they evolved to coexist with us? As ecologists, of course, as cultural or ecological anthropologists, we're not just interested in the genetics of this problem, but also in the socio-cultural, political, economic structures that shape this as well. So we're going to introduce you to some principles of evolutionary medicine. We're also going to talk, and this is important, about the method itself of evolutionary medicine, how you can ask questions. Could we develop a rubric or a toolkit for learning about a specific disease, a specific phenomenon, and figuring out what its reason for being is. Then we've got two case studies, uh, HIV and malaria. These are both uh, areas that are close to my heart. Uh, I've done a lot of work on, on these topics, and so I'm kind of excited that we get the chance to talk about them today. Let's dive in. So evolutionary medicine. First things first, we need to set up some distinctions. We're not doctors in this room even though some of you may aspire to be doctors someday, I'd like to train you to be a little different. Remember, we're learning how to think like ecological anthropologists. Medicine is concerned with health, right? It is concerned with health, and perhaps to a, a, a similar extent, a parallel extent, it is concerned with longevity. Put another way, the two primary concerns of modern biomedicine our morbidity, that is the incidence of disease, and mortality, which you guys already know from the formulas that we did a few weeks ago, which is death. Strictly speaking, as ecological anthropologists, we don't care about either of those things. We care about fitness, right? It's close, but it's not the same thing. Strictly speaking, Darwin doesn't care if you're healthy. He doesn't care if you live a long and happy life, right? What does he care about? He wants you to reproduce. He wants you to have viable offspring, right? That's his primary concern. Darwin with a capital D, right? Uh, he doesn't particularly care if you get sick and get better, if you die at a young age or an old age. Those things are secondary to the main concern, which is that you reproduce, that you pass on your genetic material. And if you can do that successfully, in Darwinian terms, you win, right? We keep saying this, as far as natural selection is concerned, as a process, it throws a bunch of eggs against the wall and it sees which ones break and which ones don't. Okay, and the ones that don't, they win. They continue on. Question? Um, yeah, so that, that means that Darwin didn't care about late onset diseases then? We're going to talk about that in a second. Did we hear that? So what about late onset diseases? Exactly. This, this is just the question I was hoping someone would ask, and we're going to talk all about that. So remember, let's go back and talk about evolution. Evolution is the process of heritable genes, right, at the population level. For humans, our reproductive strategy, our ideal reproductive strategy is basically to have a small number of offspring. Even big human families are tiny by the standards of a lot of other animals in the world, organisms in the world, right? Someone with six children, is a, that's a big family, 12, 15, is a huge number of children, right? But when you compare that with sort of a bunch of rabbits or some bacteria or something, humans aren't terribly prolific reproducers. But we invest a ton of energy in a small number of offspring. And under ideal circumstances, number one, we make sure that those offspring are healthy. And number two, we survive long enough to see those offspring reproduce. In other words, humans are built in some sense to be grandparents. Has anyone seen this happen? My, my siblings have kids and watching my own parents turn into grandparents, you see it right in front of your own eyes. It's incredible. People just come alive when they're grandparents. It's like a second life, just amazing, right? 
When you consider this, I mean, we, among female human beings, have menopause, an age that women as uh, female humans survive long past, right? The idea of living well beyond reproductive age doesn't make Darwinian sense if you're just thinking about maximum reproduction, but you're not, right? You're thinking about reproducing and then investing. So it makes lots of sense to survive long past reproductive age so that you can continue to invest in your children and their children so that you ensure their fitness too, right? You keep pushing that genetic line forward and forward and forward so that your genes live on. As such, then, this process can really only be defined, this, this measure of fitness, whatever we want to call it, can only be defined in relation to a given environment, right? We keep talking about that word, a given environment. What is fitness will be different in different times and different places, right? You'll need a different toolkit to survive different environmental stresses. We're going right back to the very first lecture here. Now we're applying these challenges specifically to the realm of health. So for us, we think of health, I mean, as, as evolutionary ecological anthropologists, we think of health as an interaction between your genetic heritage, your background, your genetic uh, inheritance, and the environment that you currently find yourself in, that given environment, which is a place and a time, a set of relationships. Health is defined as the interaction between those things to us. Really, to a certain extent, as ecological anthropologists, if you go out onto the street and are hit by a bus or something, that's outside of our concern. Right? What we're interested in is the way in which your heritage has equipped you to deal with the environment that you currently inhabit. It's important then to mention, one more time, that when we talk about fitness, as much as we talk about uh, surviving enough to, to pass on your genetic material and stuff, fitness is not the same thing as health, and it's not the same thing as longevity. All right? That's where we differ from medicine. So then, what is disease? As it turns out for us, that's a very difficult thing to define. <laughs> because we've just said right, that it's, it's a function of this interaction. A state of ill health, we would say, is a state of being maladapted to a set of environmental stresses. Right? Therefore, what is a disease at one time and place might not be in another time and place from where we're standing. Hands up who wrote about lactase persistence. Oh wow, a bunch of you. Excellent. So here's a question for you. Is lactose intolerance a disease? Why not? Mm -hmm. Wow, you guys, such good material. Anybody else? What do you think? Is lactose intolerance a disease? Yeah. I didn't write about it, but it's not because... Um, it's not because... So, like, they're not maladapted to an environment just because they're lactose intolerant. That doesn't make them less, you know... Active. Might make them less fit. So there's nothing to eat, and there's a big cow standing over there, and like a plate of cheese. Could Whew. kill the cow and eat the meat. Could cow, kill the cow. <laughs> and then you would only have dinner for one night. Ah, come on, Marvin Harris, guys, right? India, the sacred cows, Marvin Harris? Mm. So, here's my opinion on it. The, the question, is lactose uh, intolerance a disease? The answer is sort of, it depends. Depends on what's for dinner, right? If there's nothing to eat but cheese, lactose intolerance is kind of a problem, right? Might mean that you're hungry tonight. Cause all sorts of gastrointestinal distress. If you live in a place where dairy is not eaten, not needed, where you don't keep animals, if you're a hunter or gatherer, for instance, we talked about the Inuit last week, what the hell do they care about dairy? Doesn't matter, right? Not a lot of cows roaming the tundra. Yes? There's massive variability within people who are lactose intolerant. Aha! Like, Go on. Right. People have no reaction, even though they are 
Right, or sort of mild discomfort if they have ice cream but not milk or something like that. Yeah, so we have ranges even within this category of lactose intolerance. It's more of a category than a condition. Yes? Yeah, God, why aren't you better at uh, digesting uh, bleach or something? You know, that would be, that would, you're missing out on such a valuable food source here, right? The next time you're thirsty. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, we're starting to get to the core of what this lecture is going to be all about, which is this question of human environment interactions, right? We're ecologists. We want to know, uh, ecologists of health specifically, when humans interact with their environment, what are the consequences on their health and why? Hmm? All right. So, for us, for the moment, I think the way that we're going to define disease is as a mismatch. Disease is a mismatch between a patient's evolutionary or developmental background and their current environment. So a mismatch between their evolutionary and or developmental background and their current environment. Now. Remember, before you put your hand up, we're not doctors. We're not trying to be doctors. We are ecological anthropologists. This is our working definition of disease for this class. If you go to the hospital tomorrow because you have a broken arm, I promise you that it is not an evolutionary mismatch with your environment. You just have a broken arm. And the nurse will not want to do any genetic testing on you. She'll just put you in a cast. Right? <laughs> yes? Are you ready for this? Yeah, this is what we're going to talk about next. <laughs> Stay with me. You guys, you're also keen on health. I love it. All right. <laughs> A couple of more points that we need to consider when we think about evolution and health, ecology and health. Uh, one of those is the phenomenon of coevolution. I've told you guys this many times. I'll tell you again. Evolution isn't a process that starts and stops. It's not something that gets done. It doesn't get perfected. It always, always happens, right? It's constantly happening. New stresses emerge, select for new traits, and those traits get propagated, right? We've co-evolved in the presence of a bunch of other organisms here on Earth. So lactase persistence is another example. If you grow up next to a whole bunch of cows or goats or something, it makes sense to be able to exploit that natural resource. That's what Julian Stewart would say, right? Importantly, both human beings and cows look very different today than their ancient ancestors did, right, thousands of generations ago. We've evolved to accommodate one another. Lactase persistence is one of those among people who have co-evolved with cows, but there are others. Cows are a notorious reservoir for a lot of zoonotic diseases. You guys know what I mean when I say zoonoses? What are zoonoses? Right, diseases that we get from animals, essentially. Yeah, the spread of disease from a non-human host to a human being. When we start living with cows, we started getting sick with diseases that cows had. One theory is they gave us tuberculosis. And that's been a shame, right? Huge impact. On the other hand, they give us milk and cheese. So, always, always, in our ecological heads, we're thinking relationship, right? Process. If there's a pathogen that is currently antagonizing a human being, what's their background? How have they interacted in the past? And then lastly, I want to reinforce, again, that you guys are not doctors nor medical students. And the last way to illustrate this is by explaining what our concerns are as ecological anthropologists. Medicine is concerned, as a general rule, with proximate causes. Proximate causes. What are those causes? Or what does proximate mean? Guys, you've got to take Latin classes. I'm serious. Ugh, especially if you're close. Thank you. <laughs> proximate causes are the near causes. Uh, we're less interested in those. They strike us as kind of obvious as ecologists. What we're interested in are ultimate causes. Let me give you an example. You are suffering from appendicitis. What is appendicitis? Yeah, itis just means inflammation. All right, tendonitis, tonsillitis, hepatitis. 
If you have appendicitis, your appendix is swollen. It's inflamed. So if you walked into a hospital and said, I'm suffering from abdominal pain, they would look at you and say, you have appendicitis. In other words, your appendix is inflamed. <laughs> that strikes us as kind of obvious. The bigger question for us, why do human beings have an appendix? That to me is an ultimate cause. It's a more interesting question. It's a useless organ. All it does is hang around, costs you energy to grow one, right? I mean, right from the very beginning, your mother needs to eat so many extra calories in order to grow you a tiny a little appendix when you're in utero. And then you get born, you carry it around for a few decades, and then one day it goes inflamed and you have to get surgery, right? Phenomenally painful. Has anybody had appendicitis? Yeah, my dad had it, like woke up screaming in the middle of the night like somebody had shot him in the belly. It's just awful, right? And you think, what the hell has this appendix ever done for me, right? And I've carried it around for all these years. There is the difference between proximate and ultimate causes. Similarly, we could ask in the less biological mode, but in the more social mode. We're about to talk about AIDS. AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. What causes AIDS? Proximate cause? Infection with the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. That strikes us as too obvious. It wasn't, historically, right? It took us a long time to figure that out. But now that we know that that's the causative agent, that problem to me feels solved. What's more interesting is to ask why a specific individual in a specific time and place has HIV, right? Rates among certain populations in, let's say, Washington, D.C., are higher than the rates in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana. Why? What is it about that specific place and time? Again, putting on my cultural anthropologist's hat, what are the social structures, the political forces that make one person more vulnerable to this disease than another? It's caused by a virus. We know that. You can see the virus under a microscope. The virus just floats around out there in the world, but it finds its way into certain people at certain times, in certain places, for reasons that we think we can understand. Right? Those are ultimate causes, and they're interesting to us. All right? So, how do we put this into practice? How do we actually do evolutionary medicine? This part's important. There was a guy some years ago from Holland. Any Dutch people in the room? Tallest country on earth. Crazy about cheese and milk. Fact. Interestingly, shortest country on earth, anyone? China. Not so crazy on cheese and milk. All right. Tim Bergen was uh, a biologist. He actually won the Nobel Prize. He was very, very good at what he did. He was interested in ethology, which we talked about weeks ago, uh, behavior, animal behavior, animal organization. And Nico Tim Bergen suggested the following as a method. And this is important. I want you guys to pay attention to this. He said, you're confronted by a phenomenon, a biological phenomenon, like an appendix or a case of HIV. And you want to understand it from the broader perspective. You want to think ultimate causes. You want to think like the ecological anthropologist. Here, he said, is a tool for doing so. You look at that phenomenon and you ask yourself four questions. Number one, what is the mechanism underlying the phenomenon? By mechanism, we're essentially talking about addressing approximate cause. If somebody comes into the clinic suffering from AIDS, First, you need to assure yourself that they are HIV positive. That would be a good mechanism for explaining what's happening. Understand what exactly HIV is, how it operates on the body. Number two, how does this phenomenon develop during the lifetime? We spoke about the appendix, for instance. You're born with it, right? Appendicitis is essentially a congenital condition. Everybody has an appendix. You don't grow one halfway through your life and then say, oh, shame, I should get rid of this now, right? So different conditions, different phenomena have different life course histories. We've talked about developmental adjustments as being different, let's say, from genetic adaptations. That would be important to understand. Is this a condition that's acquired, right? Is it born, congenital? We've also talked about epigenetic phenomena. Very interesting, right? which are essentially neither developmental nor genetic, but something in between those two things. So we need to understand where this problem comes from, how it develops across the life course of the organism in question. 
Number three, ask yourself, what is the function of this phenomenon? How does it serve your interests? By your interests, I mean the organism in question. It's very obvious to look at a, a feathers on a bird and say, these are a very useful adaptation to the problems that a bird encounters. These feathers help it fly. They help it stay warm and dry. Right? That feels obvious. What about the human appendix? What good does it do us? Why do we carry one around? Maybe did it used to have a function that it doesn't anymore? Is there some benefit to having one? Would there be some penalty for not having one? So when you look at that phenomenon, ask yourself the functionalism question. And similarly with HIV. What good does it do me to be infected with HIV? None, particularly. It does HIV plenty of good, though. Why? It wants to reproduce. It needs a host. Can't reproduce lying sort of out on a desktop. It needs to hijack my body, so I serve as the vessel for that virus's reproduction. Right? And then lastly, the big question, how did this evolve? So again, if you're looking at fossilized remains of ancient humans and comparing them with present day humans, and there, this is an entire school of research, comparative anatomy, for instance. Trying to understand how we look different today from the way that we looked a million years ago, and why. Do those changes reflect some sort of change in the stresses that we've encountered? Similarly, and this is interesting, when you ask how it evolves, you could also ask how a virus evolves, right? They reproduce fast. And by using genetic analyses, you can sort of date back the mutations that have happened in this virus and start tracing out the family tree. Right? Why are these subtypes present in these two areas? They must have had a common ancestor, right? Hmm. Fascinating stuff. Tim Bergen says, ask these four questions you're going to get to in a, a better understanding of the phenomenon that you're looking at. All right? This is towards a method of evolutionary medicine. Let's do a case study. Let's talk about the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. The green guy on the right is the virus. Sort of a little spiky ball. That's how I want you to think of it. I'm going to explain some of the basics of HIV and then we'll talk about it as a ecological phenomenon. First and foremost, HIV is a retrovirus. What makes retroviruses special is that they reproduce using RNA instead of DNA. So they come into your body, they come into a host, they hijack your RNA, and they use it to make copies of themselves. Regular viruses use DNA. So retroviruses are sometimes known as RNA viruses. All right. I'll explain why that's important in a second. <laughs> the target that HIV virus seeks out is that big blue guy, which is a CD4 cell. Okay, CD4 cells are white blood cells in the human body, and their primary role is immune function. Right? Your soldier cells, they seek out infection and they fight it. Specifically, HIV wants to dock on a very, very specific place on the surface of the CD4 cell. That is a target, a receptor called CCR5. And that's important. So let me spell this out for you. HIV is sort of a, a spiky ball. It's covered with all of these things sticking off of it that look kind of like keys. Your CCR5 cells have keyholes on them. All kinds. One of those keyholes, sorry, your CD4 cells have all these keyholes all over them. One of those keyholes is the CCR5 receptor, right? HIV comes along, it finds that CCR5 keyhole and it locks right into it. And then it injects into that cell. It hijacks the genetic material inside that cell, not the DNA, but the RNA, that's right, the reverse transcriptase. It hijacks that RNA in order to make copies of itself. 
viruses can't reproduce alone. They need to use somebody else's genetic material to reproduce. Once they've hijacked that RNA, they start to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. But there's a limited amount of space inside that cell. After it's made a ton of copies of itself, what happens? Yeah, it pops like a balloon. What kind of cell was this again? A CD4 cell, yeah. Which is a white blood cell whose primary role is immune function. So if these things start dying off because they get burst like balloons, what happens? Yeah, your immune function gets compromised. This is how HIV works. HIV itself doesn't kill you, right? It just starts wiping out your immune system one cell at a time so that something else kills you. Right? Eventually, your immune system gets so hobbled that you're not able to respond to basic, everyday kind of health challenges. You get a cut, it gets very easily infected, it lasts and lasts, it doesn't heal. You catch a cold from somebody next to you, it develops into pneumonia and it becomes fatal. Right? So this is how HIV works. So that's that process, it docks, Onto CCR5, it injects, it hijacks, and then reproduce, reproduce, pop. And now you have thousands of new HIV cells swimming around, or viruses swimming around and looking for more CD4 cells. All right? So, in terms of the history, how we think that this came about. Uh, current best research says that HIV is a zoonotic disease. Its nearest ancestor is something called SIV, the simian immunodeficiency virus. And we have examples today of SIV infecting especially chimpanzees, who are probably our closest primate ancestor, and sooty mangabees. Is there another African primate also closely related to human beings? More broadly, further up the evolutionary tree, or down, I suppose. Uh, you also have, for instance, FIV, the feline immunodeficiency virus. People heard of this? Yes. Yeah, this is why uh, the Humane Society and things are always going about trying to scoop up cats or do culls of homeless uh, feral cats and stuff. Because uh, they're prone, even I mean, here in Toronto, they're prone to getting what's called FIV, the feline immunodeficiency virus. It's totally a non-human virus, but yeah, it infects cats. What we think happened with SIV is that it was very closely coded to, to human genetic material, right? Humans and chimps, awfully similar in a lot of ways genetically. And so what we think happened is that a hunter in Central Africa, probably in the area around Congo, Cameroon, part of the way that we can tell this is that chimps don't swim, right? So when you have rivers, they form natural boundaries for chimp populations. And then by testing the genetic material of the virus in the chimps, their SIV, comparing it to human beings, you can trace back the origins. Fascinating stuff. So what we think happened is that a hunter killed a chimpanzee. And in the process of cleaning it and dressing it and preparing it, uh, inadvertently got some chimp blood into himself. I mean, anybody who's ever seen uh, butchering happening firsthand. It's a messy process, right? Uh, and chimps are an incredibly tough animal to hunt. So this would be a long, drawn-out thing. It's quite likely that the hunter is going to have some cuts, right? And then in the process of digging through this animal's guts, some blood gets into the hunter, and that virus manages to make the jump, right? It mutates in such a way that it becomes a human disease instead of only a chimp one. One of the things that you need to know about HIV as a retrovirus, it's very sloppy at making copies of itself. Right. It doesn't reproduce well, doesn't clone. In fact, very much the opposite. It makes a ton of mistakes. Now, from Darwin's point of view, that's a good thing. Why? Yes. Okay, so one of the phenomena here is that HIV has a very long curve, a very long latency period. From the day that you're infected, if you have no treatment, until the day that you develop sort of full-blown AIDS, can be seven, ten years even. Long period during which you could be contagious. So that's good. Contrast that with Ebola, right? Which tends to kill people very fast. 
and has a very short contagious period, just a few days for Ebola, right? And this is why Ebola tends to burn itself out very quickly. A few thousand people in history have died of Ebola. Compared with HIV, we've had 75 million cases, right? Since the 1970s, half of those have died, okay? Another reason, yes? Uh, yeah, uh, is the duration of a disease uh, related to its deadliness? Not necessarily, no. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the HIV thing. Because there are reasons why HIV is happy to keep its victims alive for longer. Right? It gives them a more stable host and it increases the odds that they'll be passed on. If it kills its host too efficiently, it's hard to transmit. The other reason why HIV wants to be ineffective at reproducing, why it wants to be messy at reproducing, what are you Yes, it's a source of mutation. We talk about evolution throwing a bunch of eggs against the wall, right? And you see which ones break. HIV throws eggs like nothing you've ever seen, right? Makes mistakes all the time, crazy mistakes, right? It'd be like the equivalent of a human being who has a thousand children uh, every, sort of, every week and some of them have nine legs and some of them have 14 eyes and some of them are 10 feet tall. HIV is trying everything, random, random mutation, and lots of it, because some of those mutations work, right? Lots of them don't, but HIV reproduces at a shocking rate, very quickly makes copies of itself. So it just wins by sheer numbers. Even if three quarters of all those mutations are totally useless and they die on the vine, doesn't matter. There's still a billion more successful ones behind it. Right? Remember Darwin, this big idea Variation and time. If you've got enough of those, anything's possible. HIV varies like crazy, and because the generation duration of a virus is so short, it has a ton of time. Right? Human generations are 20 or 30 years long. HIV is reproducing in a matter of seconds. Right? Yes? Correct. So this hunter, uh, to clarify, when this hypothetical hunter, we actually probably believe that there were multiple hunters. It appears as though HIV was not a single transmission event, but multiple transmissions over maybe many, many years, generations, centuries. SIV is what entered that, that hunter's bloodstream. And in the process of badly trying to copy, most of them wouldn't work. Virus wasn't compatible. But maybe one copy of the virus that had mutated was, and HIV was born. Today, around the world, we have a few different main viral subtypes. We have HIV-1 and HIV-2, which are the two main families, and each of those have an alphabet soup of A, B, C, D, E below them. HIV-1 type M is sort of the main one, and the most virulent, most aggressive. But that suggests they're different enough from each other that they come from different sources. HIV-2, more common in West Africa, probably comes from mangabees. HIV-1, chimpanzees. All right. Oh, we could, talk, we could talk so much for hours and hours, but I do feel like we should finish this slide. <laughs> uh, those of you interested in uh, archaeology, is such a fascinating field of research right now, so much happening. Right now, the two oldest samples that we have of HIV come from some tissues that some people poking around in the basement of a laboratory in the Congo found. These were thin slices of lymph nodes or something that had been taken from a couple of patients, one in 1959 and one in 1960. One was female, the other was male. The oldest is, is the male sample. And they were living in Kinshasa, then known as Leopoldville, right? The capital of the Congo. Tested them both and they turned up HIV positive. Okay. So we now have direct evidence of people having been infected with HIV in Central Africa in 1959. What's more exciting for the biologists in the room is that the research didn't end there. They decided to sequence the genomes of the HIV virus that they found in both of these people. And what they found is that one year apart, in the same city, the virus was very different. Lots of evidence of diversification. These two people were not next door neighbors who got infected with the same strain. In fact, it suggests the virus had been around for a while. So current best guess is that by the 1920s, HIV was well on its way, especially in the Congo and Central Africa. Jacques Pepin, who we read 
this week. Pepin is a Canadian uh, a medical doctor as well as a researcher of epidemiology and public health who works in Montreal. Speaks fluent French, which helps. What was the colonial power that took over the Congo? Belgium, yes. So his French was useful. He was another of the sorts who started diving through the archives, digging up old records, finding old samples. And his theory is that, yes, by the 1920s, you had HIV present in the Congo. However, and this is interesting, there is also evidence that HIV is able to remain stable in isolated rural areas. So a team of researchers in the 1970s went into Congo to some remote villages and did blood tests for Ebola. After HIV started to boom, they thought, these blood samples, which we still have saved in our fridge, could be very useful for, for HIV research as well. Let's test them. And they came up with an HIV prevalence of about 1%, 0.8%. They went back to the same remote village 10 years later, and tested everyone's blood again, and the HIV rate, the exact same, 0.8%. So it seems as though in an isolated, stable population, HIV will stay at a stable rate and a pretty low rate at that. What happened in the 1920s in the Congo, Pepin says, huge social changes. As anthropologists, this interests us a lot. The virus is less important here than colonialism, urbanization, the construction of railroads. By the 1920s, one million Congolese are riding trains across the country. One million for the first time in history, right? Unprecedented amounts of human movement. The colonial authorities are building cities and filling them with male laborers, right? Tens of thousands of young single men shoved into a barracks together and working on plantations or mines. Sex trade starts, of course, right? Women start to move to these cities to take up jobs as sex workers. This becomes another of these amplifying events. The colonials also have uh, some sort of rudimentary health system, though maybe not the world's most sophisticated sanitation technology. So if they're sharing syringes for the 5,000 guys at the mine who are all getting an inoculation or something, this again is an amplification event, but something that a generation before in that isolated village was impossible, would never have happened. So, new relationships between human beings, between their environment, new social structures, social forces, that is how you understand the spread of HIV, Pepin says. After it leaves Africa, all bets are off, right? Current best evidence says that probably the virus moved from Africa to Haiti and from Haiti to the United States. European epidemics and southern African epidemics it took a different track at different times. Eventually, when the disease was first discovered, when was it first discovered? Does anyone know? First test, or is it not the first test, the first clinical diagnosis was 1981 in Los Angeles. The US Centers for Disease Control control uh, a handful of unique drugs. If you want to write a prescription for certain of these special drugs, you need to ask the CDC. And the CDC noticed that within the space of a few weeks, they had written a ton of prescriptions for a drug that treats a very rare form of pneumonia, PCP, pneumocystis pneumonia. And all of these prescriptions were being written for otherwise young, healthy men. The only people who get PCP are people who are near death. Elderly Jewish men and post-operative immunosuppressed patients. And these are 25-year-olds who are getting PCP pneumonia. Why are they getting it? And so they reported there might be something going on here. Might be some sort of new infection that we haven't heard about. That was the first time, 1981. So it had decades to travel under the radar. It was only when it started to boom in a country with a more sophisticated health surveillance system that the virus got caught. Who did it explode amongst? A group that came to be known as the 4-H club, this kind of glib shorthand. Who are the 4-H's? Haitians, so immigrants from Haiti. Heroin users. Remember, early 1980s, heroin is starting to boom as a street drug in the United States. 
hemophiliacs, this is people with an inherited blood disorder who need to get blood transfusions. In the early 1980s, there is still no test for HIV. It's only just been discovered. If you need to go in regularly to the hospital to get a blood test, there's a decent chance that you will be receiving an infusion of tainted blood. Eventually, nearly half of all hemophiliacs in the United States were infected. Right. And in the last age, homosexuals. So just as this is a time of big social changes in Africa during the 1920s through 50s, 60s, so the 1970s, 80s are a time of big social change in the United States. Right. You might be noticing 50s, 60s, 70s, this, con this sort of uh, matches up with what in the United States? The sexual revolution, right? Women's lib, the birth control pill, declining marriage rates, increasing divorce rates, gay rights. Stonewall riots are happening at this time, just as HIV is being diagnosed in LA, New York, right? The scene is starting to explode. The other thing that's starting to explode, international travel. Right? In the 1920s, for HIV to get to America, it would have to ride on a steamboat. Literally. It's a long trip. By the 1970s, it gets on an airplane. You go from Kinshasa to Port-au-Prince, or you go from New York to LA in hours. Right? Suddenly, people are now moving around the world faster than they've ever done before. Yes? Uh, why were homosexuals more prone? Why were homosexuals more prone? Uh, there are a handful of theories about this. Uh, one is a, a population effect, a founder effect. Um, Haiti was a popular spot for uh, sex tourism among gay American men in the 1970s and 80s. So it's possible that if there was higher prevalence in Haiti, then more American men were being exposed, bringing the virus back to their own communities in the United States. Anal sex generally is more risky than vaginal sex. Uh, receptive anal intercourse uh, is the most risky form of sexual activity as far as transmission of HIV goes. Uh, and then, it, it has to be said, this is a time of sexual revolution and gay rights. A lot of guys are coming out of the closet who have been closeted for uh, forever in the United States. And so now, there's a whole degree, a whole massive amount of sexual freedom uh, that they hadn't had before. So at the risk of sounding judgmental or something, just plain old promiscuity. Right? You have, this is uh, the time of the bathhouse boom in San Francisco, the sex club boom in New York City. So there's also, frankly, just way more uh, efficient sexual networks being created. More people connected to more people, concurrent partners, the virus spreads very fast. OK. So problems uh, around HIV. Uh, these, we're going to talk about a couple of interesting cases that are interesting for us as ecological anthropologists. The first. So the late 1990s, researchers start noticing that in some very high prevalence areas, in, in areas where lots of people are infected with HIV, you get a small subset of the population who seem not to get infected or who get infected but never seem to develop any symptoms. They can have HIV circulating in their body, but they don't actually get sick. The virus doesn't reproduce too quickly. It doesn't damage them. These came to be known as long-term non-responders. In other words, your body does not respond to the HIV virus. It swims around and it ignores you, right? And you ignore it. There's no inflammatory response. There's no pathological response. There's none. The classic case study was in Kenya. This was done among sex workers outside of Nairobi. Anybody know Nairobi? Yeah, the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in, in East Africa teeming with huge, huge uh, informal settlements, shanty towns, slums. Researchers start noticing that there are women uh, working as sex workers in these areas that are having sex with multiple infected people a day. Five, six partners in a day, 10% of whom might be infected. Repeated exposure, and they're not becoming infected. What is happening? Putting on our evolutionary hats. Now this is getting interesting, right? So. We know that these women were exposed because they were catching other things, right? It wasn't as though they were just simply wearing, uh, using condoms or something every single time. Some of these women were, for instance, getting sick with syphilis. So that suggests, okay, there is a sexual transmission of some pathogens going on here. But they appear to never develop HIV. 
What seems to have happened among this small subset of women for reasons that are still not very well understood was what we would call a sort of hyperactive T cell response. Their white blood cells were supercharged. And when you draw blood from these women, what you find is an extremely high white blood cell count. Normally with HIV patients, people who are getting sick, we find they have very low white blood cell counts because, right, it injects, it reproduces, it pops. Those T cells die off. These women didn't just have normal white blood cell counts, they had high red blood cell counts, higher than anybody else. So this suggests that the body had been exposed and had fought it off. Interesting. That is still under consideration. That research to some extent sort of tailed off in a frustrating way. It's hard to find updates about where that went because of a subsequent discovery. And that is this. CCR5, what's that again? Receptor. It's the receptor on the top of the CD4 cell. It's the keyhole that HIV needs to lock into, right? Turns out there's a mutation. HIV locks onto that CCR5 receptor, right? What if you were born without them? That would be useful, wouldn't it? Turns out if you are born with the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, if you're a homozygote for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, you're basically immune to HIV. We'll talk about the difference between homo and heterozygous in a minute. This is an odd one. It's not super common. There could be people in this room that are CCR5, Delta 32 negative. You, you'd never know it, particularly unless you went to the doctor and asked to have a blood test done. Uh, you don't experience any particularly different health uh, than anybody else. You don't look different, that's for sure. Most common in Europeans, and in given populations, most common the further north that you go. So. There's been a suggestion of some sort of founder effect. Is this a Viking genetic mutation, right? Is this a Scandinavian trait, a Germanic trait that started working its way southward? On the other hand, you also seem to have very obvious ethnic clustering. We've said that Europeans generally are the highest as a large-scale population, as a specific subpopulation, the highest rates are among Ashkenazi Jews, 13%, super high. Among Europeans, maybe 1%. Yes? Are there any other uh, pathogens or the things that attach to that specific structure? So this is what we started thinking. We put on our Nico Timbergen hats, right? What is the function of this mutation? Originally, we thought that it was about the Black Plague, right? Europe had a bad go with the bubonic plague, killed off about a third of Europe's population, and one idea was this could be a hangover from the plague. The survivors of the plague were people who were immune to it, and maybe they succeeded in passing on this gene. At the time, centuries ago, that would have been a super beneficial mutation, and over time it's faded out because we haven't had another plague, not a big one. Turns out that the mutation's older than that, though. We find this mutation going back to the Bronze Age in Europeans. So our next best guess is that it might be about smallpox. Smallpox, one of humanity's oldest kind of enemies, maybe the deadliest disease in all human history. And that CCR5 might afford you some protection from smallpox. Hard to say because smallpox has been eradicated, right? In the 1970s, we managed to eliminate smallpox from the face of the earth, and it's now only kept in sort of high-security freezers deep underneath the Pentagon. It's actually a real debate. It's a fascinating ethical question. Should we get rid of the smallpox, or should we keep it around just in case? What if the wrong person got their hands on smallpox? Nobody's vaccinated anymore. None of us has immunity to it. Yeah. So, one thought is smallpox. Then, to cloud the waters just a little bit, and make this phenomenon extra fascinating. It turns out that if you are CCR5, Delta 32, if you carry that deletion mutation, you're slightly more likely than the normal population to get West Nile disease. 
you're at a higher risk of, of contracting the West Nile virus. So this deletion mutation, this CCR5 Delta 32 is not all benefit, comes with a few costs, one of which is presumably an increased susceptibility to West Nile virus. Interesting stuff. Now, this gets especially interesting when we decide to answer the question of uh, is there a cure for HIV? Is there? People are shaking their heads. No. The answer, it's complicated. It depends. One man has been cured of HIV. He used to be known as the Berlin patient. His name is Timothy Ray Brown, an American from California who was living in Berlin. He had been infected with HIV for years. He was HIV positive and taking his anti-HIV medication, anti-retroviral drugs. He was eating his Wheaties and uh, living a healthy lifestyle, and his HIV was under control. Uh, bad luck, he contracted cancer, cancer unrelated to HIV. This was, uh, it ran in the family. And specifically, he contracted bone cancer, leukemia. Where do leukocytes come from? Yeah, white blood cells. Yeah. So remember, he's infected with leukemia. <laughs> HIV targets what kinds of cells? Those white blood cells? Yeah. He benefited from having an incredibly clever doctor who said, you're HIV positive, that's fine, but you have leukemia. We need to get you a transplant of bone marrow, right? So that you can start producing healthy white blood cells again. Since we're at it, and we're shopping for a bone marrow donor, what if we could find somebody who was a tissue match for you and who was Delta 32? Ooh. Then the donor tissue would start taking over your own and it would repopulate your white blood cells with ones that had no keyholes on them. They did it. It's a brutal process. I don't know if anybody knows anybody that's ever done bone marrow transplants, chemo. Ugh, it's, it's savage, tears your body apart. However, this was 2008, 2009. He's taken no HIV drugs since then, and they can't find the virus in his body. He was cured. They've tried this process with other people, and it hasn't worked for various reasons. This is hardly a public health solution for the 35 million people in the world who have HIV right now, but does it work? It does. All you have to do is replace somebody's entire immune system, right? Blood cell by blood cell, right? And keep sort of replacing the bad ones with the ones that you like. I see the hands up, and you know I love you guys, but it, uh, it's getting so late, all right? So, here again with this question, and I asked you this at the beginning of the lecture, I asked you, is lactose intolerance a disease? Similarly, we are left with these big questions when we talk about HIV. I can think of two. Number one, evolution doesn't really have a purpose, and it's not really directional. It's not a, it's not a, a phenomenon of progress. It doesn't want to achieve anything particularly, except to see you reproduce. No end goal. There's no end goal, yeah. Nobody pulling the strings. CCR5 Delta 32, from what we can tell, would have been a totally useless mutation to be carrying around, right? It would have been silent. The costs to carrying it seem relatively minor. The benefits to carrying it seem relatively minor. It only becomes adaptive. It only gives a fitness advantage when the environment changes. And changes how? When the environment changes to include HIV. When you start interacting with that virus, a mutation that gives you protection against it is now suddenly no longer neutral. It's beneficial. So the exact same piece of genetic information from one generation to the next was neutral then and is adaptive now. All right. So this question of what is fitness, what is adaptive, it's a tricky answer, right? It depends. It depends. The second reminder from all of this is that environments change. And I hammer on this. It's not a process of simply 
finding a perfect fit with your environment and then living happily ever after. The state of play is always in flux. The environment is always dynamic. It introduces new threats all the time. Old ones go away or they persist. New ones appear or they don't. And so what was a beneficial adaptive genetic toolkit last time might not be this time. It just depends on what challenges you meet. We had no way of knowing, in short, that CCR5 was going to be good for us until the environment changed. All right? Okay. Uh, malaria is our second example. Malaria is not a bacterium. It's not a virus. It's not even a retrovirus. It is a parasite. Nobody in this room speaks Latin. Spanish? Portuguese? Portuguese? French? Italian? Okay, malaria. What does that mean? Bad air. Bad air. Yeah. Malaria has been with us for centuries and centuries, incredibly old. The Romans called it malaria because they thought that it was caused by bad air. Swamp gas, you know? If you live too close to stagnant water, live too near the swamp, you might sort of inhale those vapors and it'll make you sick. Which, as it turns out, is not super far from the truth. The truth is that it is a parasite. That parasite is called Plasmodium falciparum. That's the most common form. There are other types of falcipar uh, sorry, Plasmodium that cause malaria, but the one that we concern ourselves with is falciparum. It is transmitted by an insect, so we could say that it's zoonotic, I suppose. It goes from animal to animal to animal. It is not passed from human to human. The vector is a mosquito, and in particular, it is the female of the Anopheles mosquito. Is that the most dangerous animal in history? Possibly. In terms of human deaths, there's a chance. Remember, we spoke at the beginning of the lecture about coevolution. Humans are not alone. Our health does not occur in a vacuum. It's tempting to think that the survival of the fittest means that the healthiest people are the ones with the biggest muscles and the sharpest claws and fangs. No, not even close. By far the most important coevolutionary organisms for human beings are microorganisms. Parasites, viruses, bacteria. They've shaped us, right? We've shaped them. Tyrannosaurus rex, saber-toothed tiger, not so much. <laughs> Those are easy problems to solve compared to a virus. All right. So here's how it works. A female Anopheles mosquito, out of spite and, and resentment, decides that she wants to bite you. <sighs> so mean, eh? Hey? <laughs> Through a remarkably sophisticated set of anatomical uh, adaptations, this mosquito is built perfectly to burrow underneath your skin with its little poker to inject anticoagulants, right, that stop your blood from scabbing up, to draw out some of your blood so that she can feed her children. In fairness, she's just trying to do her best. Right, it's not easy out there for a mom. You as a human get bitten by that mosquito. That mosquito is carrying tiny wee parasites, right? in its anticoagulant, it injects some of those into you. Those parasites then swim to your liver. They seek your liver out. Within the liver they reproduce, and reproduce and reproduce. Same old story. In particular, they like red blood cells. They reproduce and reproduce and reproduce, and then what happens? Pop. They spill out into the bloodstream, out of the liver, and they start to circulate around the body. As it's circulating around your body, what, gets hap what happens? You get bit by another mosquito. That mosquito drinks your blood, your blood's full of malaria parasites, it stores them, and then it re-injects those into the next unfortunate person that it lands on. So this is this fascinating sort of daisy chain of a human who incubates this, cooks it in their liver, spins it around the blood, the malaria uh, gets picked up by a mosquito who then flies across town and passes it on to the next unsuspecting person. In terms of the history of malaria, 
It's incredibly old, way, way back. We've talked about HIV maybe being a century old, some transmission events happening a few centuries before that in isolated cases. Easily malaria goes back 80,000 years. In fact, we increasingly think that the reason that malaria even exists is that it's co-evolved so perfectly with human beings, and when you trace the developmental history of malaria, it actually follows the path that Homo sapiens took out of Africa. Malaria walked along with us every step of the way. Okay. Is it, is it the oldest disease? Is it the oldest disease? Hard to say. Also remember, we start going much past 80,000 years, we're not really Homo sapiens sapiens anymore. Right? So if it was a disease that affected Homo erectus or archaic Homo sapiens, is it even a human disease? It gets a little complicated. But among the diseases that we talk about with any frequency, it's certainly one of the oldest. So, we have uh, historical records of the Roman and the Chinese uh, recording clinical cases of malaria going back, what, 2,000 years? Here's an interesting one for you. How many American presidents had malaria? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> All of them. Yeah, several. The United States used to be a malarial zone. Washington, D.C. was malarial. George Washington had malaria. Abraham Lincoln had malaria. During the American Civil War, huge proportions of soldiers died of malaria. How did America get rid of it? Those of you who are interested in international development and global health and stuff, America did not do bed nets, did they? Brad and Angelina Jolie hadn't been born back then. And it's the 1800s. So how would they get rid of malaria? without their help. <laughs> yeah, they industrialized, essentially, modernized. Enormous projects of public infrastructure, so rationalizing irrigation, sanitation. This eliminates mosquito habitat. Right? If you get rid of standing water, you get rid of the places where mosquitoes breed. And since humans don't pass malaria onto humans, if you get rid of anopheles, then you get rid of malaria, essentially. Right? The trick is not to kill the parasite. You can only do that once it's entered into a human. Right? The better part is to kill the vector, the mosquito. So the United States undertook enormous projects of social infrastructure building, public health. They actually had people that would go door to door a century ago in the United States and check to see if you had any standing water around your house. That wheelbarrow in the backyard, you should tip it upside down so that it doesn't pool water, you know. Or you leave an empty bucket in the backyard and it fills up with rain. They would come around and write you a ticket and tell you to empty it out. They were fanatical about destroying habitat. And as such, America is no longer a malarial zone. So we might say some very important interactions between, again, thinking like ecologists, a vector, a parasite, and a set of social structures, political economic structures. When people start to do things like agriculture, then they start to have a lot of standing water around. Right? Think about how we grow rice. Enormous pools of stagnant water. Rice is crucial. It's an absolute basic staple for over a billion people on Earth today, right? But the growing it involves creating a beautiful habitat for malarial mosquitoes. So we have trade-offs, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> we we high-fived and then we're like, ah. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> it's not impossible. Yeah, uh, this is important. When we talk about how these diseases are, are transmitted, first you need to talk about the concept or the biological principles by which it might be transmitted. And then second, you need to talk about the most likely or most common human routes. So one of those is a biological or a genetic problem of the virus itself. And the other is a regulatory issue. Um, could it be transmitted uh, blood to blood through high-fiving? That is possible. How often do we high-five one another for a long time with bloody hands, right? It's, it's very, very rare. Uh, maybe there was a time in human history when that was more common. Uh, but we seem to have regulated our way out of that behavior, right? Yes? Mm 
Right, so the vector uh, is still a mosquito, so it can't be passed on human to human. Number two, uh, the reservoir of this parasite is also uh, animal, so that's important. Uh, we talk about Ebola, for instance, same thing. Humans are not a reservoir for Ebola. They can pass it on to one another, right? You could catch Ebola from a person sitting next to you if you did a bloody high five, <laughs> for instance. Uh, <laughs> But in between bouts, uh, nobody carries it. Nobody carries Ebola indefinitely. Who does? Uh, pigs and bats. They're the reservoir of that disease, right? Whereas HIV now is at a point, HIV is a human virus. It is human only. It might have been zoonotic once. That's where its origins are. But now it is human-human contact and a human reservoir disease. Does that make sense? OK. So uh, there are some fine grains when you talk about what constitutes uh, a transmission event or who constitutes a vector, especially for us, since we're not doctors but ecologists. Yes? So will syphilisal anemia not be considered a disease in a period of time? Familiar with I bet I know where you're going with this. Hey! So, have humans and malaria co evolved? I mean, I think I've made the case that it's been around for a very, very long time, that it appears to have walked in lockstep with humans as we've made our way all around the world to all sorts of different environments, right? Obviously, malaria is still prevalent in West Africa, but it was prevalent in the United States up until very recently in the big scheme of things, right? The city of Washington, D.C. was losing so much productivity. It was so hard to get work done in Congress that they considered building an enormous net around the entire city. Fact, yes. Presidents, right, are catching this. You know. So an interesting thing comes up, and it's sort of like our CCR5 Delta 32 story. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease. It is inherited. Not zoonotic, but we would say congenital. Sickle cell anemia means literally that your red blood cells, which are normally sort of uh, shaped a bit like a bagel without a hole in the middle, right? They sort of look like that, like a disc with a little dimple. When you have sickle cell anemia, your cells, your red blood cells, literally look like a crescent moon, like a sickle. And this is a mechanical problem for the body. Red blood cells have to circulate, right? They get whooshed all around your body, and that round shape is nice and efficient, right? It goes around corners well, it bumps into things well. When it's hook-shaped, it literally just jams up. It creates blockages. You start to get necrotic tissues, you become more likely to suffer from things like uh, infarctions, and eventually, sickle cell anemia can be fatal. Usually means a, a shortened lifespan and uh, a life of, of morbidity and, and pain. In some parts of the world, though, something between 10 and 40% of the population have sickle cell anemia. And we notice some trends in who has it and who doesn't. Because as it turns out, Remember that malaria likes to reproduce in red blood cells, or, or rather, <laughs> the parasite likes to reproduce in red blood cells. If you have sickle cell anemia, you're immune to malaria. This is sort of the flip side of this HIV question, and it invites some interesting ones for us. So why would an unhealthy trait persist? If sickle cell anemia is so bad for you, why would you have a part of the world where 40% of the people are walking around with it? Shouldn't Darwin have selected them out a long time ago, right, and replaced them with healthier people? Well, there are a few reasons. There are three, in fact, reasons why an unhealthy trait might still turn up in relatively high numbers in a population. The first is just random mutation. It keeps coming up. That's always possible. Even if you removed all the carriers of this disease from the population, a generation or two later, by random chance, somebody else is going to be born with it. This happens, right? Humans don't clone ourselves. When we reproduce, it's imperfect. And so you always introduce a bit more variety. And one of those variations might be a brand new case of sickle cell anemia. That's possible. The second, and somebody asked this at the beginning, and I was so glad that they did, is what we would call late mortality. Remember, that brutal lesson, Darwin doesn't care if you're healthy. He doesn't care if you live a long life. What does he want you to do? Reproduce. And soon, 
get on it, guys. Uh, <laughs> or, or don't. Uh, I don't, yeah, I, don't listen to me. Uh, don't ask an anthropologist. Uh, Darwin doesn't care if, if this disease strikes you down when you're past reproductive age. In fact, Darwin doesn't particularly care if this disease strikes you down the day after you have children. That's not ideal. He'd like you to stick around, invest lots of energy in those kids, in their kids. That would be the best. But really, if this disease strikes you down past reproductive age or past reproduction, period, doesn't really have an impact on fitness, does it? So in that case, that disease might persist. I know some of you might have come up with this in the vitamin D uh, skin uh, color research. I mean, something like skin cancer, not a huge fitness stress, is it? I mean, relatively lowish mortality tends to strike you later in life. The bigger problem is something like folate or rickets. You know, those are, those are more proximal threats. And then the last reason why it might stick around, if it's not simply because of random mutation or late mortality, is the difference between homozygosity and heterozygosity. <sighs> Have people heard these terms before? The biologists are going to be happy with those. In short, if you are homozygous for something, for a specific trait, then you carry two copies, two identical copies of the allele of that particular gene. In sort of uh, layman's terms, in shorthand, if both your parents gave you the sickle cell anemia trait, right, then you are homozygous, you've got it 100%. If you are heterozygous, then you carry only one copy of the allele for that specific trait. Yes? The best state to be in when it comes to sickle cell anemia and malaria is to be a heterozygote. In other words, you've, you've caught only one of the traits. That means you still show some sickle cell traits in your blood, but not enough to make you terribly sick, terribly morbid, right? Not enough to, to hugely increase mortality, but enough to give you protection from malaria. You get the best of both worlds when you're a heterozygote. This is what we would call, and I think this would be a fantastic name for a rock band, the heterozygote advantage. <laughs> All right? So you can imagine this is another mechanism where the trait would continue to persist. It doesn't need to get passed down by both parents, and in fact, it's better if it doesn't. But as long as one parent keeps passing it down, then you have a whole generation of heterozygotes who get more of the benefit and less of the disadvantage, right? All right, so this is an example, again, of one of these traits that operates in a funny way. Yes? Uh, yeah, the question is about, well, at the population level, how many generations can this go on of heterozygotes and heterozygotes? Um, there, there's, there are a handful of genetic reasons that have to do with inheritance. Uh, Mendel was the first guy that, that I think really talked about this. Uh, and a whole series of, of really interesting mathematical models explaining how this works at the population level. If this many people reproduce, and this many of them carry the trait, and this many don't, and so on. Suffice to say that the heterozygote advantage is best. Did, did you want to? Okay, go ahead. I was going to say, the two heterozygotes in this case, if you had hetero, two heterozygote parents, um, you have three potential phenotypes. Right. So you're either, you're either homozygous totally. for, like, for um, yep. a sickle cell, or uh, you're homozygous for completely healthy, or you're heterozygote, but you have 50% chance that you're heterozygote, yeah. and then you only have a quarter for the other two. So that's why there's more heterozygotes. Statistically, you technically have four options, uh, if you want to think of it this way. Those are almost two separate options, even though they're the exact same r result. So statistically, yeah, when two heterozygotes are reproducing, they're most likely to give birth to someone who's also heterozygote. It becomes a statist applied statistics, right? What's the most likely outcome given this four-sided dice? Keep rolling it a bunch of times arranging it in pairs. Yeah. Won't be on the test. <laughs> I promise. Uh, okay. So, what does all of this mean? Well, again, is sickle cell anemia a disease? That's a hard question. Yes. Increases morbidity, increases mortality, immiserates people that are sick with it, 
On the other hand, our answer is kind of it depends. Are we talking about homozygous or heterozygous sickle cell anemia? Heterozygous involves some pretty mild symptoms and then protection against malaria. If you live in a malarial zone, that's a trade-off you want to make. I mean, you could say these days I'll sleep under a bed net, you know, or take malaria prophylaxis or something. But historically, this has been a massive form of protection. Right? It's been a fitness advantage. So this disease is also beneficial. It's also adaptive. Depends on the environment. If you were a Sherpa, would sickle cell anemia be at all useful to you? <laughs> it would not. No mosquitoes at altitude. Some serious problems about circulating blood, right? With high hematocrit, high vasoconstriction, you cannot afford to have anything like impaired circulation. Living at sea level in West Africa, practicing agriculture, a lot of standing water, fishing in mangroves, yes please, right? I would love to, to take the heterozygous advantage and go to their concert next week. <gasps> so, we have an interaction, again, genes and culture. This has been selected for across millennia of human development. It has co-evolved as we've moved into new environments, picked up new subsistence techniques, like farming, like freshwater fishing, Right. As we've built cities, as we've built public health infrastructure, right. all of these have shaped our relationship with malaria, and malaria has changed too. As it turns out now, uh, resistance to malaria medication is now quite common among some forms of the parasite, and resistance to pesticide is more and more common among some forms of malarial mosquitoes, some strains of anopheles. So we throw challenges back at malaria. Remember, it lives in an environment too. And we're a part of its environment. We present challenges to it, it responds to those challenges. In some cases, we've been totally successful. Washington, DC, not much malaria there anymore. Two thumbs up, George Washington. <laughs> but still other parts of the world, no traction, right? Okay, yes. Can you think about it in a lactose intolerant way? If you live in I have a hard time thinking in a lactose intolerant <laughs> way. But go ahead. If you live in an environment right. If you're at the dinner party, right? Yeah. I went to a dinner party years ago where we all ate uh, salmon. And it was delicious. It was fantastic salmon. And there were two people that didn't eat it, and all the rest of us got horribly sick, you know. <laughs> that was the vegetarian advantage, <laughs> right? <laughs> Vegetarianism was a fitness adjustment in that case. Uh, well, fitness, I don't know. I don't think, well, actually, you know, two of the people that were at that party now have children, so <laughs> as I think about it, Sarah wins that contest. Mm. Uh, right. So, we end up thinking these great big thoughts. Are mutations adaptive? Well, from the point of view of evolutionary medicine, it, it really depends. This is what I meant at the beginning when I said, you know, we think of disease as being a mismatch between you and your environment. Uh, that's a little different from how a doctor, a nurse, a tech thinks of disease. Obviously, disease can also be caused by trauma, right? You fall down the stairs, you're unwell, <laughs> and you need fixing. It can also be caused just straight up by environmental conditions that uh, are totally uniform and totally random. You can become hypothermic. You can eat bad food, something like that. But the main lesson there is that for us, as researchers, health is not the same thing as fitness. Longevity is not fitness. Happiness, frankly, is not even fitness. <laughs> Just get out there and have kids, fast, many as you can. And then pour all sorts of energy into making sure that they have kids too. And then your work here is done. The other big lesson is that the environment itself always changes. It's not just us. Right? We adapt to those challenges, and then those challenges change too. We have to readapt all the time. And because we're in interaction, the interesting thing about health now, we're not just talking about humans adapting to something inanimate like a mountainside or a desert. We're talking about humans adapting to another organism. So this is a multivariate variance. Both of the parties in this relationship are changing all the time. 
Malaria keeps adjusting, we keep adjusting, we adapt and adapt. And then here we are in the year 2014. You can sort of take the temperature of how that relationship's been working. Tinbergen uh, gave us four questions to ask about how we can understand this process, how you could look at a phenomena, a development, and understand where it comes from, what role it plays. That's important. And then between HIV and malaria, we have this question. I mean, do we have hidden adaptations? Are there mutations in any of our bodies right now that are going to protect us from the zombie apocalypse? We don't know yet. Have to wait for the zombie apocalypse to happen. Right? You don't know if you're immune. Similarly, in the case of malaria, something like sickle cell anemia, very, very common in the United States. Still, why? Slave populations, right? A founder effect. West Africans being brought to the southern United States who were coming from malarial zones, reproducing and reproducing, and now sickle cell anemia remains prevalent in the United States, and it's a pain in the ass from a public health point of view. America is not malarial in the year 2014, right? Carrying this cell, being heterozygote for sickle cell in Chicago is pointless. There's no malaria anyway. It doesn't offer you protection. Now it's only a disease. Now there's no benefit, just cost. It was an adaptation and a very good one. Thank you, Charles Darwin, right? But it's outlived its usefulness. In this environment, it's no longer adaptive. The environment changed, right? Okay. I'm going to end with this one. Oh, ho. does everybody know our friend Louis Pasteur? Infectious disease, I'm convinced this is the future. I think when you guys have children and they have children and you're merrily investing in their reproductive fitness, I don't think they're going to be worried about cancer. I don't think they're going to be worried about diabetes or heart disease. I think they're going to be worried about infectious disease. I think antibiotic resistance. Right? I think new viruses. When was the first case of Ebola? When was this, this disease discovered? 1970s. Brand new. HIV, 1981, right? brand new diseases that up until now we had no idea even existed. And how many people have died of HIV since the 80s? 35 million, right? Until very recently the leading cause of death among all humans worldwide between ages 15 and 49. This is the number one killer. Cool. So I think Pasteur was right when he said in the end the microbes will have the last laugh. Time and variation, they're better at this game than we are, right? 